Hello. So I've now been asked several times to explain how the magic works inside of Floppy Bridge, the interface for WinUAE and AmiBerry that allows you to use real disk drives on the emulator. Well in this video, I'll break the golden rule of the magician and I'll reveal all the secrets to all of my tricks. I'm not going to explain the actual code, instead I'm going to explain how most of the trickery actually works visually and step by step. Don't worry, we'll keep a track of the tricks and we'll start with the easy things, the bits I got working first. So my first goal was to make sure that the emulator didn't freeze up or stall while accessing or controlling the disk drive. So I decided the best way was to put all of the floppy drive control logic into a separate thread and have WinUAE queue commands to that thread. A thread allows you to run more than one task at the same time, or at least appears that way. Queuing commands for the thread to execute would ensure absolutely no delays and therefore no reason for the emulator to freeze. The thread could work its way through the queue, executing each queue command in turn, one at a time. I started with simple commands, like turning on and off the motor. Now I know that seems like a fairly straightforward task, and it is, but even that small amount of time taken to instruct the hardware to do this could cause a delay or a glitch in the audio. The next thing I looked at was track selection. The head is moving back and forth by stepping one of the control lines high and low, and this finds its way into a section of the WinUAA code that watches for these high and low estates from the Amiga's registers and then uses this information to work out what the current track is. That makes it easy. I just queue up a go to track X command and off it goes. With these two features implemented, I managed to start the emulator and I got the famous tick from the drive. It was actually quite magical to hear, but I soon realized I needed to do a little more work here. The seeking to another track doesn't happen instantly. When you are e-side, it might slowly increase the track number as the emulator steps between tracks. So, in the unlikely event that we end up with another seek command whilst one is still in the queue, I just overwrite the one in the queue instead. This stops some of the intermittent weird noises as the drive intermittently stepped in and out. This is also the reason why the drive doesn't sound the same as it would on a real machine. I suppose this could be improved, but getting to the data as fast as possible is far more important. So the next thing I need to do was get Kickstart to recognise a disk being inserted. While the queue was empty, I would periodically poll the drive to see what the state of the disk change pin and the write protect switch was. To start with, I would just pass this information onto WinUAE. Disk change, however, is a little more complex to implement than you might expect, and so I had to do a few extra things to make it more reliable. You may have noticed it takes a little longer than you'd expect for WinUAE to see a new disk after you insert it. Well, there's a few extra actions happening first before I want to let WinUAE know about the disk. From Kickstart 2.0 onwards, when a disk change occurs, the Amiga performs a strange handshake with the drive to identify the type of disk that is present. This information helps identify the disk as double density or high density, and isn't available from any of the pins on the back of the PC floppy drive. For this information to be presented correctly, I need to know the type of disk before the Amiga accesses it. So firstly, when Floppy Bridge detects a disk change, it spins up the drive, which usually takes about 400 milliseconds, and then reads a sample of the data from the first track. It then performs a statistical analysis on the data to try and work out if the disk inserted is double density or high density. Double density disks will have flux transitions appearing at 4, 6 and 8 microsecond intervals, whereas a high density disk will have flux transitions appearing at 2, 3 and 4. So I count the number of 2, 6 and 8, and based on that I can decide if it's double density or high density. For the Amiga to read a high density disk, the drive used to spin the disk at half the speed. So if I detect the disk is high density, I take all the flux timing values and double them. Now all of that's done, I turn the motor back off and signal a disk change. Which leads us nicely onto reading data. When the motor is turned on, the track data isn't available instantly. As I said before, the drive has to spin up to speed, typically taking around 400 to 500 milliseconds. When it's at the correct speed, the drive asserts a ready signal so the Amiga knows it's safe to start reading. I delay sending this ready message and take advantage by pre-caching the upper and lower sides of the current track. This improves performance and reliability. Most of the time, disk reading is performed via DMA, and in this case, it's an emulated DMA. The emulator plays the disk data into the DMA buffers, but it also has to account for the sync word detection that the Amiga provides in hardware, which can trigger an interrupt. The way it does this is by periodically processing a small amount of disk data, typically several MFM bits, and then writing that to the DMA buffer. 
It also does a look ahead, so it knows exactly when one of these sync word interrupts should occur. Not only this, but as it's reading the data, it's also tracking the simulated physical position of the disk so it can generate the required interrupt when the data reaches the index position. Finally, it also tracks this position so it knows when a complete revolution of the disk has occurred, and then it can request another copy of it, if another is available. For example, with SCP files where multiple revolutions of a single track are often included. So, for the emulator to read the disk properly, we need to be able to provide it with a complete revolution of data from the disk, with no joins or seams. A full, seamless revolution. This is actually the heart of the whole problem. Whilst the disk should spin at 300 RPM, it's most likely it won't be exactly. And also, that assumes the emulator will be simulating the Amiga 100% real-time, which it isn't. Aside from those issues, the data doesn't arrive smoothly. It comes in small blocks, which is part of the way the USB protocol works. If this data data comes in too fast, then you'll end up with an ever-growing backlog of disk data, and too slow, well we'd never fill up an entire track in the first place, so neither of these approaches would work. So instead, I invented a special class called the Revolution Extractor, and it comes in two modes. The first, and perhaps most basic, keeps watching the data as it arrives until an index pulse is detected. Then, it starts storing the flux data until it finds a second index pulse. At the second pulse, the code starts checking for an overlap or repeat in the data from when the first and second pulses were found. And once it finds a good match, it splices the two and passes that to the emulator with a careful calculation of the number of MFM bits. The overlap check is very important, as the index pulse isn't always exactly to the microsecond in the same place. And if a flux transition occurs exactly on the index pulse, things can get very messy. At one point, whilst writing this code, I had a bug where I miscalculated the total number of MFM bits and I missed a single bit. This caused one of my disks to intermittently not boot. I spent ages writing text versions of the binary data to disk and checking how it was splicing them together until I found the problem. Now we have this complete revolution of data, the emulator can play that just like one of the files, and all's happy, right? Well, the problem with this is, to read a full revolution of the disk takes approximately 200 milliseconds. But with this algorithm, worst case, we also have to wait for the first index signal, which could be up to another 200 milliseconds. Then, if that's not bad enough, the emulator will then simulate reading this data, and that will take a further 200 milliseconds. That brings us up to 600 milliseconds for a single track read. That's three times slower than a real Amiga. So I came up with a second method. Earlier, I mentioned that when the Amiga turns the drive motor on, before telling it that the drive's ready, I read both sides of the current track. Well, as part of the reading of these tracks, I get the code to calculate an average total time for each revolution. This can vary between disks due to wear and between drives, and it varies enough to make a massive difference until at least the disk is removed, when reading any further track data, I no longer need to wait for the index pulse. I can start reading and recording the data immediately, and keep going until enough flux time has passed. When we get within the previously calculated spin time, I can start the seam matching algorithm again, but as this is less likely to be as accurate, I make the search window much wider, and once it finds the overlap, it passes it back to the emulator. If for some reason it fails to find a good match, then the algorithm continues like before, waiting for the two index pulses, at least one of which it will have already received. With this change, the total read and playback time takes approximately 400 milliseconds. Now there's a very, very small number of disks this doesn't work with, which is why you can turn it off, but that that saving is well worth it. Still wanting to improve things further, I had another idea. During the 200 milliseconds while the emulator is playing the track data, I'd switch to the other surface of the disk and read that track in too. Often, the opposite side is the next track to be read anyway, and now with some disks the speed is almost as fast as a real machine. This of course depends on how well optimised the disk is for reading or loading in the first place. For some disks, Lemmings being a good example, it was several seconds quicker. Now you may be thinking, why is the Amiga so happy waiting for data from the drive for well over 200 milliseconds at a time? Well, I'm guessing there's a possibility that a long timeout would help with disk read errors, which would cause rereads from the disk. But also, a certain amount of latency or delay is actually allowed. Deep within the data sheets for a floppy drive, and I've had the misfortune of reading a fair few of these, there are several timing diagrams. Spinning up the drive can take at least 400 milliseconds, so I can take advantage of that. Plus, floppy drives have what's called a settling time, which occurs after seeking to a new track. There's also a settling time, although much smaller, when switching between 
the disk sides. Whilst none of that should be anywhere near 200 milliseconds, because hardware is unpredictable and not perfect, it seems Kickstart allows a lot of flexibility here, and that's even more flexible with Kickstart 2.0 onwards. This was true, however, with one exception, writing data. The problem with writing data is the data can't be written to the disk in real time as it comes out of the emulator. Same problem as before, the two speeds won't match. The write transfer is usually performed by DMA, and this DMA buffer can be accessed from WinUAE. So it's easy to know when data has been fully sent. I have to record this data, and then, when complete, write it to the actual disk. The Amiga always writes a complete track every time, and so to ensure there's no strange data at the overlap, it sends more than a revolution's worth of data. So, approximately 200 milliseconds after receiving the data from WinUAE, the data has been finally written to the disk. But here's where the problem comes. 99% of the time, immediately after writing the data, the Amiga tries to read the track back again to verify it, which it won't be able to do, because it's not available yet as I'm still writing it, and any track in memory would be the previously cached copy of this track. Now I could just copy the received data to the cache and have that played back to the Amiga, but there's two issues with that. Firstly, we have no way of actually handling disk write errors that way, and secondly, the block of data being written from the Amiga is typically more than 200 milliseconds worth to cover the overlap, and so this would be hard to work out where the proper revolution of the data was. So, instead, I added a rather dirty hack, and I'm not particularly proud of it. When the write DMA completes, it generates an interrupt, which the Amiga uses to do the next thing. For example, it might write another track or read back the current track. Until that interrupt occurs, it still thinks the writing's going on. So what I've done here is to delay that interrupt until I've had a chance to finish the write and read back the track into the cache. This means that WinUAE now has a fresh copy of what I wrote to the disk, and it's a genuine copy of the data too, so if there are any disk errors, it will know. Surprisingly, this works almost perfectly. It just means writing takes twice as long as it should. But I had another idea to speed that up. I know the Amiga can't write anything that isn't exactly 4, 6 or 8 microseconds, and so there's no copy protection issues to worry about. So, I enable turbo mode for the readback, so the Amiga receives the data much, much faster. This brings the whole process close to the time taken on an original machine. So now let's take a look at copy protection. There's several methods of copy protection that I need to overcome, and I didn't want to code for any of them specifically. Instead, I wanted the solution to just work properly. There are basically four things that need to be in place for copy protection to work. 1. Correct representation of the index pulse. 2. Proper simulation of the speed of the transitions on the disk. 3. Accurate simulation of the Amiga's PLL. 4. Handling of unformatted areas of the disk. The first, well, that's easy. I'm already using the index marker, so that's just making sure the information is passed on to WinUAE at the right moment. The second, this is required for disk with long tracks or sectors at slightly odd speeds. WinUA already has support for this, so I just need to make sure I'm passing this speed, or density, information about the MFM data onwards after extracting it from the flux timings. The third is the PLL. The Amiga's PLL must be simulated exactly so that the flux transitions are correctly converted to the correct MFM bit sequences, and therefore all of the copy protection techniques like flaky bits on games like Dungeon Master work properly. The final version of the PLL code I adapted from code used by the SCP file code written by Keir Fraser, already present in WinUAE. Now the last one, unformatted data. Unformatted areas of a disk present themselves as random noise each time they're read. For this to work, every revolution I need to try and provide a new recording of the track. This will ensure that any unformatted areas create a different recording. To do this, whilst the queue is idle and the motor is enabled, I'm constantly rereading the track data from the disk, and if I manage to read another complete revolution, I cache it for swapping to next time when UAE has completed a revolution. To make this seamless swap out of the track recordings, I store data about the overlap discovered during the previous track. After a revolution has been extracted, this data is then used to realign the recording so that they all start at the same exact position. I allow up to three recordings of the track data to be stored in case the drive is busy, so there's always a new recording to swap in or out. So I mentioned turbo mode. Well, with support for copy protection and being able to decode data into MFM, I can then lie to WinUAE about the speed the data was actually received at. I can tell WinUAE that the data was read much faster. As the MFM data is already decoded and extracted correctly, the speed information will not affect how the data is interpreted by the Amiga, and it will carry on reading that MFM data perfectly, just much faster. And in most cases, it means that a DMA transfer happens almost instantly. This would break some games, which is why it's not on by default, but it's great for Workbench. 
Taking this technique one step further, I invented Smart Speed, which tries to be a little more clever. It looks at the track data for each revolution to see what sort of speeds are in there, and if they're all roughly in line with what a normal track is supposed to look like, it temporarily turns turbo on, as this probably doesn't contain any copy protection information. This works most of the time and really speeds up loading, and in fact, it can actually cause some games to load quicker on the emulator than in the real machine. The last thing I implemented was auto caching. This isn't really anything special, just while the drive is idle, the code will attempt to cache the remaining tracks in memory speeding up disk access for later. A very simple solution. So that's a total of 19 tricks revealed. I wouldn't make a very good magician. These tricks didn't happen all at once mind you, they took a while to figure out. Months in some cases. And if you feel all that effort was worth it, then why not consider supporting me on Patreon? I hope you found this breakdown interesting, and I hope it gives you a better understanding of how this crazy stuff works. The actual source code is freely available on my GitHub page, so feel free to take a deeper dive. Well that's it, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.